Today, we are going to talk about, bless you, we're going to talk about splines. So, in particular, we're going to talk about the first, we're only going to do the first two sections of chapter six. We'll do a definition of what a spline is. We will uh, talk about how we do linear and quadratic spl splines. That's the goal for today. And then we'll <laughs> talk about a little bit about why we want to change to cubic splines. And so that'll be what we're going to talk about on Tuesday. And how to get home over that. So hopefully we will get through all of that stuff by Thursday. So again, we can try to get everything to run on Thursday with your assignments and then tidy up whatever we need to do with splines on that day. And then you can have a good break and not think about this class for a week. That sounds like a plan. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, what, we, what do we mean by a spline? So we've done polynomial interpolation where you're given a set of points and you want to try to make a function that goes through all the different points, right? We did that with polynomials, but we said one of the issues with polynomials was that uh, it may have some wild oscillations, even if the function is pretty well behaved. Let's see if we can recreate that issue that we talked about before. If I get a mouse back. If I get a mouse back. There it is. All right. So remember that. Um, If I have the function that is just um, 1 over 1 plus x squared, choo -choo. Mm -hmm. you get that nice smoothly shaped curve there. Nice, it's not quite, it looks like a bell-shaped curve. It's not typically what we call this bell-shaped curve because bell-shaped curve refers to normal distribution, which is some scaling of e to the minus x squared. That's technically what a bell-shaped curve is as far as normal distribution goes. So we saw this function before. We generated a list of evenly spaced points between negative 5 and 5. Oops. We can generate that list of points just by using that list notation to double check that I really did get those evenly spaced points. We have that, right? And then uh, if I want to plot those points, let's see if I can do that cleverly. Let's say we want to plot. I'll need to plot, plot and then redraw the function back through them again. So let's say if I do x list and y list, or not y list, but let's do f of x list. Let's see if it'll plot the points. There we go. There was just the individual points, right? And then I can add the curve back in there. So I just picked evenly spaced points on that curve. We've seen this example before, so I'm going quickly. If we try to use the polynomial or a polynomial interpolation to approximate these points, well, notice we're going to have to use what degree here? We've got one, two, we've got 11 points, I think, total. Five on this side, five on that side, that one. So we have 11 points, it would be a 10th degree polynomial, right? If we do that polynomial interpolation and graph it instead, which I think I can do quickly in here, let me do, put the divided difference method in there. Let's say, and then let's do my polynomial interpolation. And if I do the curve and the polynomial, if I can spell. Yeah, I forgot to put the X in there. Oh, I know why. <laughs> I didn't name anything Y list. I put F of Y list or X list. Yeah. 
There we go. We got that wild polynomial, right? It was okay here in the middle, but trying to fit one single polynomial to those points, it went crazy towards the ends, right? Okay. So the moral of the story is, even if the points are well behaved, and in this case, all of the points here were um, evenly spaced, that's actually part of the problem in this case, uh, ironically enough, all the points are evenly spaced, they're nice points, they're on a nice function, it still started to go crazy the farther away we got from the middle. Right? Okay. And trying to add more points isn't going to help. It's still going to get even crazier in the middle, or on the, on the ends here, I mean. It's, it's okay in the middle, this is bad on the ends. So, again, the idea behind this is that if I have a set of points, Finding a single polynomial going through all of those points may not be the best option. As a matter of fact, one very simple thing that probably would have been better than trying to use a single polynomial would have just said, connect these two points of the line segment, connect these two points of the line segment, connect those two points of the line segment, and so on around, and that would have been a lot closer to the actual function than trying to fit a polynomial through all of them. Right? That's the idea of splines. You're going to take a specific type of function and try to fit the data from point to point and then have some conditions on there depending on what you want the conditions to be. And we'll talk about what we mean by that here in a little bit. So this is the whole point of splines. I don't want to do necessarily a polynomial interpolation because, again, that requires a single polynomial to go through all the points. We're going to change that instead of saying, we're going to use a polynomial to go through consecutive points and then change the polynomial as we go. So that was the idea here. If I said if I just take a line segment here and then take a line segment here, one here, one here, and so on, that changes the that changes the polynomial, and that was a better fit. Even without smoothness, it was a better fit, right? Okay. So here's, here's what we mean by spline. So let's let, um, we're going to do this to where all of our uh, x values, our inputs are all going to be in order. So let's assume that we've got everything in order. So uh, the book uses t's rather than x's to start with. I'm not sure why, but I'll you go with what the book uses as far as t's. We're going to let t less than, t not less than t1, less than t2. Let's do Tn. And let's just consider the set of points. T0, Y0, T1, Y1, T2, Y2, out to... T N Y N. All right. So we've got a set of points that we want to try to get a function to go through each of these points. The only reason why I set up the first part is just what we're going to, I mean, even though if I would have written it this way, you probably would have assumed it, but that's better than assuming because you know what happens when you assume. Let's actually explicitly write out that I want the numbers to go in order. The reason why I want the numbers to go in order here is because the way we're going to fit this data is we're going to go from left to right and just fit it as we go along. All right, so uh, a spline of degree n, pardon me. <coughs> is a set of nth degree polynomials and the way we'll write them down is I'll call it uh, q naught of x q1 of x up to q sub n minus 1 of x I stop at n minus 1 because my q naught 
I'm going to use from 0 to 1. My Q1, I'm going to use from 1 to 2. Yes? Is that Q1 or is that Q1? I should be Q of X. Just, I thought I wrote an X, but... Your Q0 goes from 0 to 1. Your Q1 goes from 1 to 2 for the point, right? So your Qs of n minus 1 will go from n minus 1 to n. I don't need to go any farther. Okay, so I'll have n, poly I'll have n polynomials to go from 1, 2, dot, dot, up, dot, up to n sets of points, n, n pairs of points, I should say. Okay. So the degree n talks about the nth degree polynomials that we'll use. So if you're doing a spline of degree 1, these polynomials will be of degree 1. If it's a spline of degree 2, each of those will be a quadratic. If it says degree 3, it'll each of them will be a cubic and so on up the line. Okay? All right. So, of course, we need to make some uh, conditions here that need to be met by these particular functions in order to be actually a spline. So, hopefully, one condition should be pretty obvious. That I want to make sure that where this one ends, this one begins, right? I want to make sure that it's continuous all the way across, right? I don't want to have one of my splines go up and then I have another one come from well, the bottom and go up to the second one. That doesn't do me any good, right? I want to make sure that they're at least continuous. But as they go up in degree, the whole reason why we want to go up in degree is that we can make other things match. If I use straight lines, I can't make the slopes match, but I can make the endpoints match, right? But if I use quadratics, I can make the slopes match at those points. If I use cubics, I can make the slopes and the curvatures match at those points. And so on up the line. Okay? So if it's an nth degree, I'm sorry, if it's a spline of degree n, then I want to make sure that going from the function values to the n minus first derivatives all match at the interior points, okay? So we need to make sure that q sub i minus 1 of t sub i is equal to q sub i um, t sub i. I need to make sure that q prime of t sub uh, of i minus 1 t sub i, my, sorry, T sub i, we well, got lots of letters going. Q prime of i, T sub i, and so on down the line until I get to the n minus first derivative matching. All right, so I don't need to worry about what happens on the endpoints because I'm not trying to match up anything at the endpoints. That's why I'm going, my i goes between 1 and n minus 1. Right? Does that make sense? I don't, even, I don't care what happens at the endpoints. Okay? <coughs> but I do care what happens in the middle. I need to make sure each piece matches up. I need to make sure the slopes match. I need to make sure the curvature matches. Third derivative, fourth derivative, fifth derivative, all the way to the n minus first derivative. Okay. So again, if it's a degree one spline, then I'm just worried about the first condition. I don't worry about the slope matching, which would be really, really hard, right? If I've got three dots that aren't all on the same line, if I try to go from a line from one to two, I'm going to have to use a different line from two to three, and my slopes aren't going to match. All right, you'll get a sharp corner. This is what we mean by a spline. So notice that these are all continuity conditions, right? Function is continuous everywhere on the interval from P0 to Pn, I should say. The function is continuous, the first derivative is continuous, the second derivative is continuous, and so on down the line. Okay. So we have a special name for that, sec the, that section, that type of function, I should say. Um, this is just a notational thing if you see it. So, if a function f has n minus 1 continuous derivatives, all 
on um, an interval, I'll say A to B, that F is in the set C n minus 1 of A, B. So your set of continuous functions are all C0, but they may not be C1 because they may not have a continuous first derivative. If you have a function with a continuous first derivative, then it's C1, but it may not be C2 if it doesn't have a continuous second derivative, and so on and so on. Okay. So C, C or C0, whichever way you want to look at it, C0. So that's just set of all continuous functions. C1 is set of all differentiable functions on the interval. C2 is all twice differentiable functions on the interval, and so on and so on. The, the C just stands for continuity, and then the exponent looking thing just stands for how many derivatives are continuous on the interval. Does that make sense? I, I don't care if you really, I, it, for this particular class, I don't really care if you know what the notation is. It just it pops up in the book. So I just want to make sure that if you look at the book, you see that <laughs> that notation's in there and then you know what it means. Okay. All right. In any event, we're going to be interested in finding these splines. And like I said, today we're interested in finding linear, uh, degree one splines, degree two splines. Okay. Linear splines, quadratic splines. Uh, in fact, I, our goal, my goal here is to at least get an R, the R code is really going to be simple for the first part, get some R code to be able to draw in the linear spline and see if we can come up with an R code or at least an algorithm, maybe not get the code today, to get an algorithm for the quadratic spline. And then we'll do, move over to cubic splines next week. Uh, one last little thing, of course, in math, we have to change words on you as we go. I don't know why. We typically we refer to these as points, typically. When we did interpolation, we called them nodes rather than just points. Of course, now we're going to have a different name for them now. In splines, they're called knots. Okay. So these points here are called the knots. <laughs> okay. Honestly, I have no idea why why they're called knots versus nodes or points. But that's what they're called in split when you do splines. Um, this is a brief side uh, excursion here to talk about it. The word spline actually comes from using flexible pieces of wood in boat making. It used to be that to get the, the, the designs for boats, they would take flexible pieces of wood, hang weights from them, and get the drafting of the, the, what needed to be made for the boats to make the wood bend. That's where this word spline comes from. It's literally bending the wood is to make boats. Like knots. Yeah. It's probably yeah, well, it explains the knots too, yeah. Because <laughs> you use knots in the boat. That would have been my guess, but I don't know that for certain. But it probably comes from where the weights were hung, made the knots. That's probably what happened. But what's it? Knots in the wood. <laughs> yeah. Now or it could be knots in the wood too. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever seen a French curve, French curves are used in drafting to draw splines. If you haven't seen a French curve, you can ignore that. Uh, it's also used in pattern making in clothes. We'll talk about why those particular curves are useful when we get to cubic splines. All right, anyway, so let's see if we can figure out how we could uh, code up finding a linear spline, because that one's going to be easy, right? If I've got a points, can I figure out the equation of the line between two points? Yeah, that's pretty straightforward, right? Okay. At any given point, I can start here and go to here. So if I say your Q sub i of x, well, your Q sub i of x, your function has to be, well, if I put in T sub i, I have to get whatever the Y sub i is, right? So it'll be Y sub i. We know what the slope is. It has to go from the t sub i to the t sub i plus one point, right? 
So I would do y sub i minus y sub i, uh, oh, sorry, y sub i plus 1 minus y sub i over t sub i plus 1 minus t sub i, and then x minus t sub i. That's what your function is going to look like, right? I got to go from ti, yi to ti plus 1, yi plus 1. The easiest way to do that is start at y sub i and follow your slope to the y sub i plus 1. That's just point slope form written in a slightly different way. And we can check if you put t sub i in here, I get y sub i. If you keep put t sub i plus 1 in here, those will cancel and then your y sub i will cancel. So you get exactly what you want. All right. And this will be true then for <clears throat> zero, uh, yeah, zero less than or equal to i, less than or equal to n minus one. That's it for the linear one, right? <clears throat> We're creating what's referred to as a piecewise, piecewise continue, uh, sorry, piecewise linear continuous function. It's piecewise linear because each of the pieces are linear. So let's go back over to. A computer. Wait five minutes for me to get a cursor. All right. Let's um, just go back and plot my points to start with. There was what our points were. Let's see if we can get the piecewise linear part put in here. Well, I've got we've got the x values, we know the y values, and now we know what the function looks like or the equation of the line looks like going through each of those points, right? We would take the first one on the list and go to the second one on the list, take the second one, go to the third one, and so on up the line, right? You agree with that? Okay. So we can write a function if we'd like. Go up here to my function window. Now all I'm going to do right now is write a function that plots each individual line. You can talk about how you would figure out what the coefficients are each time if you wanted to actually figure out what the lines were. Oh, again, I'm going to plot each individual line here. That's the idea as we go. Okay. So I need to go all the way through my list and do each one. If I'm going to go all the way through my list, what kind of programming structure should we probably use if I want to go all the way through the list? <clears throat> a for loop? Yeah, probably a good idea, right? Now remember, we start with, we called them Q0 going from 0 to 1, Q1 going from 1 to 2, and so on, but in R, the list starts at 1, not 0, right? This would work out nicely if it were in Python, because Python starts everything with a 0 to start with, right? With the list. All right, so we want to go from 1 to we have the first one, but we're only going to have n minus uh, n minus one of them, right? We'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But there's eleven points, right? So I only need to go from one to the length of our list. Minus one. If I have n points, I'm going to have n minus 1 functions. So we just need to create the n minus 1 functions here. Uh, be careful when you're doing this programming, and I made this mistake yesterday, and it took me an hour to figure out what the heck I did with, with doing a different one. I want to go to the length of the list, minus 1. Make sure you put parentheses around that. If I do 
one to the length of x list and then put a minus one on the end, it subtracts one from every element in the list. So it creates a list and then subtracts one rather than subtract one from the last, uh, how far the list is going to. So, Yeah, I mean, it's probably gonna do it at runtime, yeah. It's because he's probably, it's probably just because we haven't, um, it's probably just because we haven't added something that has this yet. Yeah, because we haven't actually added it in this module yet, so it's probably just probably because we need something else in there. That's my guess. <laughs> All right. Now, what I want again, what I want to do here is just I want to add my functions in here <coughs> and draw the the pieces. So I've already got the points plotted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a curve every single time. So that I can see what the new one is. Okay. So I'm going to use the curve command, and at the end I'll put the add equals true. What I want to type for my curve is just the line that goes between those two points. Okay. If I did not, I could have also at the very beginning here, and probably from a programming standpoint, I should. I should probably put in the plot the points here so that we can see them. Right. And then if I want to specify my X window, I can, but let's just leave it as that and see what happens. If I wanted to do this to start with, I'd want to make sure I have a plot to start with and then add the curves in. Okay. All right. The good news is that I only need one command in here, so I don't need to put the braces. It doesn't hurt to put them, but I don't need the braces for my for loop here because I want to have one command that follows it. Okay. So I don't need the braces. It didn't hurt to put them in, but I don't need them. All right. So remember what the curve is. We start at the y value and go up using the slope to the next y value, right? So we should go in for the index here. We should go in the index right here. The I should go there, right? So that's gonna that's gonna be where we start. Then we need the slope. So what should the numerator be? Okay. That's the numerator for our slope, right? We want to get to the next y value. This is a rise, right? What do I need to divide it by? Good. I could spell, that would help. So that's the function value we're starting at. This next piece is just the slope computation, right? What do I need to multiply that by? Minus 
good. Good. So remember our function was, I'll write it on the board here. That was our function, right? That we came up with for each one. So all we're doing is using the subscript as our index of our list, right? It doesn't matter that in the notation that we're using, we had started zero and ended in minus one. It's still the same idea for the functions here. Okay. The last thing we need to do here, I only want to draw, this will draw the line, right? Without any issues. Don't do this, but let's just, let me show you what's going to happen if I don't do something else, okay? Oops, I did forget one thing. I do need the add equals true here. But right for the right now, don't do anything yet because we're going to put something else in front of that here in a second. Okay. If I just run this the way we have it, that's what I get. That doesn't look very good, right? <laughs> Because I've got lines going, that was a cool picture, but I've got lines going everywhere, right? It's not approximating the function like we said we wanted, okay? So I don't want to just leave it like this. I do want the add, that add equals true command in there because I want to make sure that I plot the points and then add each individual segment. But what I need to do is I need to cut down how far I want this to be drawn. I only want this function to be used if I go from the i point to the i plus first point, right? So to do that, go back up here. In between up here, I'll type in x lim equals. What do you think needs to go for our x limits? Good. Oops. Uh, I should be at one. I'm trying to zoom in a little bit so you can see it. I only want this piece of the graph, the function graph, from the x value at i to the x value at i plus one. Does it help that I zoomed in a little bit? Yeah. I zoomed in, but I can't see everything. I don't know. I don't know if it's better or worse. <laughs> and this should do it. The only thing I don't have is if I actually wanted to write the functions down, so all this is doing is plotting it. But let's see what we have here. Uh oh. because I had it zoomed out too far. There we go. There's a picture. But there wasn't any problem with the code that I could see, but there's our piecewise linear spline, our degree one spline for those points. Yes, so just verifying, mm -hmm. a, a spline is just a piecewise linear a degree one spline is a piecewise linear. A degree two spline would be a piecewise quadratic continuous approximation. But it all, not, but it has to be more than continuous. I need to make sure my derivative is matched too. So if I have a quadratic, each piece would be a piece of a parabola, but also my derivatives have to match each of the points. Not only do I have to match, I can't be matching like this. All right, I have to match like this. Yeah. Can you show what x goes to be? Uh, yeah. 
know, maybe. Hmm? What was the five? It was um, the one over one plus x squared. Do you have an So uh, let me just put it back up there for you. Probably easier for me to say it again. So right after that, right after that comma before the add in that curve command that you have. You want to type in, oh for heaven's sake. You want to type in that. What I just highlighted. Yeah, equals T, yeah, that. So I also want to make Try try having another command now. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so um, uh, write it as x less equals, and then negative five colon five. Oh. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess you can do more. Yep. That would do it. Yep. All right. Other questions at all? Like I said, the piecewise linear part is pretty straightforward. Maybe the coding has a little of issue here or there, but the, the process makes sense what we're doing. Just finding the equations of lines. <clears throat> okay, ready to change it up to quadratics? Okay. All right. Ooh, let's see if I can get that off of there again. <clears throat> oh, that was where I wanted to be. All right. So remember your quadratic functions. We're going to need each piece to match up just like we talked about before. The ad additional condition that we're going to have is as we do the derivatives at each no or each not, sorry. We want to make sure as you come in from the left, the derivative matches as you come in from the right. Okay. So let's just start with a general formula. Well, let's think about what first, I'm sorry. Let's first think about how many equations we have. Okay. So if you have a general quadratic, how many coefficients do you have to find? Three, right? You got to find a constant, an x term, and an x squared term, right? I have n point, and how many, uh, sorry, how many functions are you finding overall? Well, again, we, we, start, we kind of start counting at zero and go up to n, so it's n plus one, so the number of functions is n, right? So how many coefficients do you have to solve, solve for then? If each one has three. Three n, so how many equations are we going to need to find? Three n of them, right? We're going to need to find three n equations to be able to solve, correct? Well, we get some of them for free, right? One of the conditions is those continuity conditions at the knots, right? We need to make sure qi minus 1 of ti equals qi of ti, right? <clears throat> and this will be up to n minus 1. <clears throat> How many equations are there? Okay, we have n of them, right? Okay. <laughs> so there's n equations. Of course, what better each of those be? When I put in t sub i, what better I get out? Well, remember, we're going through ti and yi. What better that come out of that? No better be the yi, right? That better come out of that, right? Okay. So when I put in qi and ti, I better get that. And that also is for from 0 to n minus 1. So now we have another n equations, right? Okay. The last thing we need, if we're doing quadratics, the last thing we need is the derivatives to match up in the middle, correct? So we need qi prime, uh, sorry, qi minus one prime of t sub i to equal qi prime of t sub i. <clears throat> but does this start at zero? No, we don't care what happens at that left endpoint, right? This is only from one to n minus one. So how many equations do we come up with total? 3n minus 1, right? Or well, 1 short, right? This last one doesn't give us an, another condition. We only get 3n minus 1 total conditions here. So we'll have to handle that separately. We'll talk about how we handle that in a minute. Because, and we're gonna, what happens is we're going to have to extend this idea when we move it up to cubic one. Okay. We don't have enough information to solve for all of the coefficients exactly with only 3n minus 1 conditions. But we only get these 3n minus 1 conditions from the definition of being a swamp. Okay. So I'll have to handle that separately. But for argument's sake, let's say we we're going to handle that. And we'll talk about, like I said, we'll talk about it at the end. For argument's sake, let's say we can handle that. Well, let's say that our Q sub i function has the form, well, making, if I write it in a special form, I can make 
One of my coefficients is very easy, but it's by making it y sub i. If, instead of writing it as powers of x, I write it as powers of x minus t sub i. Because now if I plug in t sub i for x, I get y sub i like I'm supposed to, right? We agree? Okay. All right, so we got, we said we had three n coefficients to solve for, but if we write it in this form, which we've done before, right, we're just doing a shifting idea, I can find n of them easily. They'll have to be these, right? So our goal really is to find what the b sub i is and what the c sub i is. And we're going to do it constructively. We're going to assume that we have one already made and we're going to make the next one. Okay? We're going to work from left to right. I mentioned that before, right? That's why we want to make sure we have our knots in order. Okay? All right. So the next one in the line would look like this. Oops. I forgot my plus ones here. The next one in the line would look like this. Yes? Just changing the i's to i plus one? Okay. The idea behind this is we're going to assume we already know this one. And we're going to figure out this one. We know the b sub i, we're going to try to figure out the b sub i plus 1. We have a couple of conditions that allow us to do that, right? We just said that we have these two conditions here, don't we? So let's use both of those. If I put in t sub i into the q sub i plus 1 equation, what do you get out? If I put t sub i plus 1 into the q sub i plus 1 equation, what do I get out? Looking at the right-hand side first. Just get the y sub i plus 1, right? Because these two terms cancel, right? In the other side, I would get y sub i, b sub i times t sub i plus 1 minus t sub i plus c sub i times t sub i plus 1 minus t sub i squared. That's one equation, right? But not only do the function values have to match, the derivatives have to match. Well, again, let's look at the right-hand side. If I differentiate the right-hand side and then put in t sub i plus 1, what do you get out? Yeah, the derivative of that goes away. The derivative of this is just b sub i plus 1. This will bring a 2 down in front, and you're left with this term. But if I put in t sub i plus 1, it's going to go away, right? So we get just a b sub i plus 1, right? That's all we get there. The left-hand side, when we take the derivative, the y sub i goes away. We're left with b sub i and a 2 c sub i times t sub i plus 1 minus t sub i. Okay. So far so good with the symbols everywhere? Okay. All right, we're going to do this in pieces. I'm going to figure out what the c sub i is in terms of this thing that I don't know. 
plug it in up here and get it solved for this piece of I piece in terms of things that I do know, okay? So if you solve the second equation for C sub I, you get B sub I plus one minus the B sub I over T sub I plus one minus the T sub I. Uh, two times it, sorry, on the denominator. Forgot my two. All right, I just subtracted B sub I over and divided for this one. Now I'm gonna take this and plug it into the first one. That was a lot of writing. All I did in that step was take out the C sub i and plug in the expression we just found. Now remember, you're given all of the t's and all of the y's. Those are the knots that you're given, the points that you're given, right? You're given all of the t's, all of the y's, we're assuming we've already computed the b sub i. We want to find the b sub i plus 1. So we want to solve this equation for b sub i plus 1. Right? And that'll give us b sub i plus 1 in terms of things that we know. Uh, in that last term, notice that your t sub i plus 1 minus t sub i will cancel out of the denominator, right? We agree with that? Okay. Just to save some steps, I would subtract the y sub i over. Let's divide out by the t, uh, t sub i plus 1 minus the t sub i. I'll make those go away. It'll be in the denominator of that piece. Multiply everything by 2. That'll make 2 of those minus 1 of those. And then I need to move it to the other side. So when you're done, you'll get minus b sub i and then plus two times y sub i, oops, y sub i plus one minus y sub i over t sub i plus one minus t sub i. Okay, so again, we're assuming we already know what the b is, the b sub i is. This tells us how to compute the next b sub i plus one. It also now, if we know what the next b sub i plus 1 is, we can figure out what the c is, right? It's a little weird. I have to know what the next b is before I can find the c that I want is in that particular equation, okay? So the way this is going to work when you, have a, when you have one of these quadratic spline ideas is that you're going to start with your z naught, or your b naught, sorry. Your book uses z's and I don't know. You're going to start with your B0, whatever that happens to be. You'll calculate your B1. You'll use that to get your C0, and then you've got your Q0. Okay? Then you'll go from B1, calculate your B2. From B2, we'll give you C1, and now you've got your Q1. Okay? So it's a little weird, right? If I think about them lined up. I'm not worried about, because you, again, your first ones are just this, right? Right? Oops. This is your first one, right? I need to know what this is in order to get this one. Once I get this one, I find that one. Once I know this one, I get that one. Once I have that one, I can get that one. This is kind of the process we go through to get these. Actually, from a programming standpoint, I would find all of those and then use all of those to get all of those. 
because it's how I coded it up yesterday. <laughs> Might think of a different way to do it. All right. But notice that I said I have to start here. Remember we said we only had B, uh, 3n minus 1 equations to start with, right? This is where you're going to have to make an assumption of what that B naught is. You got lots of free reign for what you can actually choose it to be anything you want. Two common ones are first, make your first segment just be linear. So that B naught will be the slope of your line from T uh, T naught to T1. That's one thing you might do is just make the first segment linear. Another thing is that you might just make it zero, make the derivative zero at that point. <clears throat> So there's two possibilities usually what you'll use. We'll talk about those next time. Think about how you would code this up though. Do that for Thursday, how you would code this up and figure out your B's and figure out your C's. And we'll wanna, we'll wanna code it up so that we can get what the spline looks like drawn. Okay. All right? Have a good one. Uh, yeah, we'll see that on Tuesday, right? No class Thursday, okay? So think about that.